Hello, I'm Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Welcome to another edition of The Pagan Invasion. In a previous program, we examined the history, theology, and worldwide influence of Joseph Smith's Latter-day Empire, the Mormon Church. We learned that at the heart of Mormon teaching is the belief that Joseph Smith was called by God to be the new leader of the true church and that he alone was to be the anointed dispenser of God's will on earth. One of the revelations that Smith allegedly received is the belief that we can become gods through the careful adherence to Mormon teaching and faithfulness to the Mormon church. What must one do to become a god? The answer lies in a host of bizarre and mysterious teachings, magic clothing, baptism for the dead, multiple wives, blood oaths, blood atonement, spirit babies, celestial sex, secret rituals and occultic practices. Today we're going to examine the secrets of the Mormon church and take you behind the closed doors of the impervious Mormon temple to discover the dark mysteries of Joseph Smith's Temple of Doom. Mormonism's uniqueness rests in the fact that it was the first successful attempt to pass paganism off as Christianity. The rituals practiced in Mormon temples are of two types, those done for the living and those done for the dead. Both rituals are identical. The latter, however, are done with someone standing in for the deceased, who, they claim, are waiting in spirit prison. They say that if the departed spirits choose to accept the rituals, they are then allowed to go to paradise, the home of all worthy Mormons who have died. This bizarre idea is contrary to biblical teaching which forbids communication with the dead. Such practice is considered a form of witchcraft and sorcery. Thousands of new converts have been brought into the Mormon church due to its vast missionary program. Unfortunately, most are initially kept unaware not only of their true beliefs, but what goes on inside the temple. In response to a number of complaints, two motion pictures, The Godmakers and The Temple of the Godmakers, were produced, presenting the Mormon temple ceremonies on film for the first time. Salt Lake City, Utah. International headquarters for one of the fastest growing religions in the world. The Mormon Church, also known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, presently has over 5.2 million members worldwide. Within the next 50 years, the church expects to have more than 70 million members. The Mormon church was organized in 1830 by a man named Joseph Smith, who claimed that, as a 14-year-old boy, he had actually been visited by extraterrestrial beings who commanded him to establish the only true church. Shortly after Joseph Smith's death in 1844, Brigham Young, the second prophet of this newly formed church, led a pilgrimage of devout Mormons across the American plains, eventually settling in the Great Salt Lake Valley, now the center of the state of Utah. Today, Mormons account for more than 70% of Utah's population. Much of the early growth can be attributed to the practice of polygamy, among various early church leaders and members. For example, a Mormon man and his many wives could have upwards of 50 children, all of whom would be raised Mormon. Thelma Gear is an active ex-Mormon and author of the book Mormonism Mama and Me. She is the great-granddaughter of convicted Mormon assassin John D. Lee. One of these pioneers was my great-grandfather, John D. Lee, who had 19 wives and 64 children. He married a widow lady and her four daughters. One of those daughters became my great-grandmother. John D. Lee has over 5,000 descendants, the majority of whom 
or Mormons. Today, the growth continues. Financially, the Mormon Church is one of America's wealthiest corporations, yielding an estimated $4 million per day from its business empire. Vast tax-exempt property holdings abound in all 50 American states, throughout Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and South America. Hundreds of millions of dollars are brought into the church each year through its mandatory tithing program that requires large portions of its members' income. Mormon meeting houses, which are used for Sunday services and social functions, are being built at the rate of two per day around the world. These differ tremendously in function, however, from the few Mormon temples that exist. Only bizarre secret ceremonies are practiced inside and are reserved for an elite group of the most dedicated and self-sacrificing Mormons. Ed Decker spent 19 years in the Mormon church. He is a former elder and temple Mormon who is now the director of Saints Alive and ex-Mormons for Jesus. He is also co-author of the best-selling book, The Godmakers. As Mormons, we called ourselves true Christians although we really felt superior to those of the rest of Christianity because we had so many written supplements to the Bible. We had a living prophet and so much more revealed information. But when I was a Mormon, I believed, as did my LDS friends and our leaders, that the so-called Christian church was really the whore Hello? of Babylon, and the temple ritual taught us that the Christian churches were led by those who were in the employ of Satan. Because of the vast difference between Mormonism and biblical Christianity, we've produced a piece of animation to show you what Mormon theology is really all about. Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified god and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. Through obedience to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Korah. Here, the god of Mormonism and his wives, through endless celestial sex, produced billions of spirit children. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. Both of Elohim's eldest sons were there, Lucifer and his brother Jesus. A plan was presented to build planet Earth where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus who would become savior of the planet Earth. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him in revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. Those who remained neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. The spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter-skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Early Mormon prophets taught that Elohim and one of his goddess wives came to Earth as Adam and Eve to start the human race. Thousands of years later, Elohim, in human form once again, journeyed to Earth from the star base Kolob. 
this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. But after Jesus Christ grew to manhood, he took at least three wives, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Through these wives, the Mormon Jesus, for whom Joseph Smith claimed direct descent, supposedly fathered a number of children before he was crucified. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians, who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. Thus, the Jesus of Mormonism established his church in the Americas as he had in Palestine. By the year 421 A.D., the dark-skinned Indian Israelites, known as Lamanites, had destroyed all of the white Nephites in a number of great battles. The Nephites' records were supposedly written on golden plates and buried by Moroni, the last living Nephite in the hill Cumorah. 1,400 years later, a young treasure seeker named Joseph Smith who was known for his tall tales, claimed to have uncovered these same gold plates near his home in upstate New York. He is now honored by Mormons as a prophet because he claimed to have had visions from the spirit world in which he was commanded to organize the Mormon church because all Christian creeds were an abomination. It was Joseph Smith who originated most of these peculiar doctrines which millions today believe to be true. By maintaining a rigid code of financial and moral requirements and through performing secret temple rituals for themselves and the dead, the Latter-day Saints hope to prove their worthiness and thus become gods. The Mormons teach that everyone must stand at the final judgment before Joseph Smith, the Mormon Jesus, and Elohim. Those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. The Mormons thank God for Joseph Smith, who claimed that he had done more for us than any other man, including Jesus Christ. The Mormons believe that he died as a martyr, shed his blood for us, so that we too may become gods. Ed Decker, who appears in the film The God Makers, was a dedicated Mormon for more than 19 years. I recently asked him to explain the significance of the Mormon temple ceremonies. Ed, what was Joseph Smith's personal involvement in the occult? Well, Joseph Smith, the first prophet of the Mormon church, was heavily involved in the occult, as was his family. They were involved in necromancy, which is the conjuring up of the dead spirits. They were involved in uh, seeking hidden treasures through mystical means. They were involved in what they called folk magic. Could you explain how Joseph Smith brought some of these occult beliefs into the Mormon church? He was heavily involved in it and when he began the Mormon church and in particular brought the occult powers into the Mormon temple ritual themselves. Lucifer is the main instructor in the Mormon temple ritual. He's the, and of course in Mormonism, he's the brother of, of Jesus, the literal brother of Jesus, and everything that we learn in the beginning parts of the Mormon temple ritual themselves come from Lucifer's mouth himself. He, he speaks these things out to us. In the Mormon temple ritual, um, the first thing that happens, of course, is that we go down into the lower part of the temple and we're stripped nude. We're given a, a, a little poncho type covering and then the the um, priesthood men there wash and anoint every part of your body with water and oil. Um, each part of your body is chanted over with special significant blessings that make that body part function properly. And then when that's done, you're giving a secret mystical name and then you're given a, a pair of uh, magical underwear 
uh, some long johns that you're to wear the rest of your life. And on the breast, the navel, and the knee of this undergarment of the priesthood uh, are the markings of the square, the compass, and the rule of Freemasonry, of all things. When you go upstairs and you put on the rest of your white costume, you are then uh, able to watch a scene taking place where Lucifer is instructing Adam and Eve and how they could become a god and a goddess by eating the fruit of a tree. When Adam takes a bite of the apple and becomes all-knowing, he then turns to Lucifer and he says, what is that apron you are wearing? And Lucifer says it is the emblem of his power and priesthood. And then the ritual is stopped, and each of us who are participating are instructed to put on our own fig leaf apron, which, of course, is our green fig leaf apron. And God rejected that fig leaf apron in Genesis 3, but here we are wearing it as the, as the symbol of our power in the Mormon temple. The apron that Lucifer is wearing has the all-seeing eye of Osiris, the square and the compass and the rule of Freemasonry also. The, the whole background of Mormonism is tied to Freemasonry. Uh, Joseph Smith was a Mason. Uh, the Masonic Lodge in Nauvoo, Illinois was the largest of its kind. Uh, over 1,400 Mormon men were members of the Masonic Order, uh, Brigham Young. Uh, and the next three presidents of the church were high-level Masons as well as being Mormons. There are many Freemasons in the Christian church today. How exactly is Freemasonry not compatible with Christianity? Basically, Carol, Freemasonry is paganism to the core. Uh, it's Baal worship, and those Christians who are involved in Freemasonry are really bringing Baal worship into the congregation. Uh, the Mormon church, uh, some of the most pagan acts of the Mormons in the Mormon temple come from Freemasonry, the blood oaths of swearing to have your throat slit from ear to ear or, or your tongue ripped out or your, or your breast ripped open and your heart ripped out or your belly ripped open and your bowels and your intestines spewn upon the ground are, are, are the blood oaths of the Mormons and the blood oaths of the, of the uh, Masons. In the Judeo-Christian Bible, Lucifer is considered the embodiment of evil due to his rebellion against God. In Mormonism, however, Lucifer is the hero. For if Lucifer had never instructed Adam and Eve to rebel against God, then we wouldn't have ever known that we were supposed to become gods ourselves. Mormons view the fall of man as a blessing in disguise which opened the doorway to godhood for the human race. The temple, with its secret rituals and chants, is the heart and soul of Mormonism. Every Mormon who expects to become a god must be married in the eternal marriage ceremony. We will be Any previous Christian or civil marriage is of no significance to the Mormon who is working his way to godhood. This authentic reenactment of the Mormon temple ceremony was first featured in the film The Godmakers. Because most Mormons are not supposed to know what goes on inside the temple, Mormon officials now consider the viewing of this film sufficient grounds for immediate disciplinary action, including possible excommunication from the church. Brother Pratt, having authority... Chuck Sackett is a former Mormon temple worker who participated in thousands of ceremonies over a nine-year period and conducted the mystical veil ritual at the Los Angeles Temple in California. After entering the temple, men and women are separated. These initiates, or patrons, first enter a dressing area where they are instructed to remove all their clothing, which is then placed in a locker and locked with a key. Their naked bodies are covered with a poncho-like sheet called a shield. I wash your head, that your brain and intellect may become clear and active. Your eyes, that you may see clearly and discern between truth and error. Your nose, that you may smell. Ceremonial washings, anointings, and blessings are then performed on each part of the body by a temple worker. And in the spine. Your breast, that it may be the receptacle of pure and virtuous principles. Your vitals and bowels, that they may be healthy and strong and perform their proper function. The initiates are then dressed in the garments of the holy priesthood, which must thereafter be worn 24 hours a day every day of the year, with certain exceptions for public athletic events and bathing. 
but for many devout Mormons, they are not even removed for moments of physical intimacy. It will be a shield and a protection to you against the power of the destroyer until you have finished your work on the earth. This magic underwear acts as an occultic talisman, supposedly providing the wearer with protection from satanic forces and their terrible consequences, so long as it is worn constantly and temple vows are kept. When a Mormon goes through the temple to receive his endowments, he's given a pair of this holy Mormon underwear, and he's instructed to wear it at all times. The garment is supposed to be worn next to your skin, and with your other undergarments on top of that as to protect your body. It's really just like wearing a rabbit's foot. It's a superstition. The patrons proceed through exquisitely beautiful halls to a room where the Mormon version of creation is presented on film. The patrons listen as Lucifer instructs Adam and Eve that there is no other way to gain the knowledge to become gods than to disobey father and eat the fruit. Adam learns that the apron Lucifer wears symbolizes Satan's power and priesthoods. Lucifer instructs Adam to make himself a fig leaf apron to cover his nakedness. And then we temple patrons are told to put on our own fig leaf aprons and we wear these throughout the rest of the ceremony. Why any child of God must wear an apron that is symbolic of Satan's power and priesthoods is never questioned by any temple patron. Mormons are even buried in their temple clothes with the apron as the very center of that holy attire. As part of the endowment ceremony, all temple patrons chant pay, lay, ale while making a gesture of submission. We are told this is taken from Adam's prayer in the Garden of Eden, which Lucifer answered. Pay, lay, ale. Whatever the meaning of pay, lay, ale, Lucifer has authority to answer that prayer. In order to take part in these ceremonies, the Mormon must be determined worthy by Mormon officials. Being worthy includes paying a full tithe and abstaining from coffee, tea, alcohol, tobacco, and agreeing to wear the holy Mormon undergarment 24 hours a day. Once inside the temple, the Mormon becomes immersed in a series of rituals directly lifted from Scottish Rite masonry. Joseph Smith was heavily involved in masonry during the 1840s, and in fact, the Masonic Lodge in Nauvoo, Illinois, was installed in March of 1842 under his direct influence and control. As I've studied both subjects, I've realized the, the, the oaths, the secret words, the secret names, the tokens, the special hand clasps, all the things that I did as a Mormon in the temple ritual, all those come from Scottish Rite. The sign is made by raising the right hand. The first token of the Aaronic Priesthood represents having your throat slit from ear to ear and having your tongue torn out by its roots. The execution of the penalty is made by placing the right thumb under the left ear, drawing the thumb quickly across the throat to the right ear, and dropping the hand to the side. The first token of the Melchizedek priesthood represents having your belly ripped open and having your vitals and bowels gush out upon the ground. The wording has now been revised to be less offensive, yet each patron still swears an oath that rather than reveal these secret words and gestures, he would agree to be killed by the priesthood. No such oath exists in all of Judeo-Christian history except those of pagan and occultic origin. Mormonism teaches that there are certain sins that the blood of Jesus Christ will not atone. The Mormon's own blood must be shed. My great-grandfather was one of those men known as the destroying angels or the Danites who cut the throats of certain Mormon people who had committed offenses against Mormonism. Some of the sins for which Mormons have had in the past their blood shed, the throat slit, were adultery, stealing, marriage to a Negro, perhaps the most dangerous, was taking certain oaths there in the Mormon temple and then denying those oaths and not living up to their contract. I think the most tragic of all was that fathers would follow their own sons and shoot them out of the saddle because they were guilty of apostasy. They were trying to leave the Salt Lake Valley and get away from Mormonism. 
The Mormon Church of Utah can no longer practice blood atonement, nor polygamy, because of the laws of the land. However, they do hope someday that they will reinstitute both practices. Is blood atonement really still practiced in the Mormon Church today? Well, blood atonement, of course, is the doctrine that there are certain sins for which you cannot uh, be, a, you cannot receive atonement for. You can't, you can't earn back the right to be forgiven, and you have to shed your own blood for them. And in the early days of Mormonism, many, many people um, shed their blood against their will in order that they might be atoned for in their sins, and that they could spill their blood on the ground and that would become a sweet smelling aroma to God to forgive them so that they could be physically resurrected. Uh, today many of the branch groups of Mormonism still participate and practice it. The LeBaron group for example, uh, just recently a number of people were killed uh, in, in a big shootout dealing with, with blood atonement for having left the cult. What about some of the occult symbols that are around the temple? Well, again, when you're dealing with paganism and you're trying to be look like Christians, but you're really pagans, you can't get away with, with uh, putting crosses up. You can't have a cross in a pagan building. And so there are no crosses in any Mormon church anywhere in any Mormon temple. But what you find are the pentagram, the uh, goat of Mindy's, the inverted five-pointed star. You find all these things everywhere around the periphery of the Mormon temples. These are occult symbols and they're on the very doors. The all-seeing eye, uh, secret handshakes, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, the the uh, various uh, phases of the moon and astrological uh, uh, symbols are everywhere on the Mormon buildings. You know, when I wore the, the sacred undergarment of the Mormon Church for many years, uh, I was told by my leaders that when I wore out a pair that I would take the occult markings on the breast, the navel and the knee, and cut them out with scissors and burn those by fire, which is an occult practice. And the, the interesting thing is that when you did this, the flames would shoot two and three feet in the air. I mean, it was weird. I mean, we thought, wow, look at the power of God. But it wasn't the power of God, Carol. It was the power of the demon forces that were involved in those talisman uh, articles that we were wearing. You've been through the Mormon temple, Ed. What powers do you believe are operating in these ceremonies? I truly believe that Lucifer is the god of the Mormon temple ritual. It's, it's evident in every single aspect of it, Carol. Uh, I stood in the Mormon temple with my thumb to my throat, swearing to have my throat slit from ear to ear if I revealed the secrets. Jesus Christ, the God of Christianity, would never require that kind of an oath from any believer. Uh, Lucifer would. And what, what I remember of the temple ritual was that uh, very significantly was that when when uh, Adam and Eve came out of the Garden of Eden, they they built an altar in the lone and dreary world they called it, and at this altar, Adam knelt wearing his sacred undergarments, wearing the marks of the priesthood, the the square and the compass of Freemasonry, wearing his his apron, and he cried out to God, "Oh God, hear the words of my mouth!" And Lucifer responded to him and let him know that he was the God of this world. And I believe that, even though it's subtle uh, in the way it's taught, it proves that Lucifer really is the god of Mormonism. Later on in the ceremony, I remember standing at the great white veil, and on the veil were the square and the compass cut into the veil, and I remember reaching my arms all the way through, right up to the armpits, right to the shoulders, and embracing this man, pretending to be the Lord. And here I am, surrendering my entire soul to this God, my arms totally immersed in the markings that Lucifer had said earlier were the emblems of his power and his priesthood. Does anyone see occult beings during these rituals? There are occult beings everywhere in the Mormon temple. It's, it's, it's a, a thing in which the Mormons think is, they think it's some great uh, experience to see some spirit being walking down the halls or floating down the halls or in particular during baptism for the dead many, many, many times. They see whole groups of people off to the side, spirit beings, as they baptize each person by proxy. That person in the spirit group will disappear and they think this is some great miracle of God. And these are demon spirits that these people see, and it draws them 
deeper and deeper into this mystical ritual. And that's the irony of the whole thing. They say it's Christian. And they, they, they present themselves as a Christian church, and this is as far removed from Christianity as the deepest, darkest Hindu practice could ever be. But how have the Mormons got away with packaging this kind of occult behavior under Christian veneer? Because they don't tell the truth. They don't package what they do, they package what they think people want to see. They package happiness as family home evening, families are forever. They you know, they put all these packages together for television advertising that show the father loving the son and communicating uh, with the wife, but they don't tell you that they communicate with the dead when you're not looking. During the temple ceremony, the Luciferian legacy is reinforced by a strange story in which Lucifer wears an embroidered apron signifying his power and authority. Lucifer directs Adam and Eve to fashion similar aprons for themselves. Temple Mormons are then instructed to put on these same aprons. Mormons are even married and buried in these aprons, which represents Lucifer's power. Brother Pratt. Having authority, we lay our hands upon your head, foreign in behalf of John Kimball, who is dead. And Incredible as it seems, identical temple rituals are performed for the dead as well as the living with someone standing in for the deceased. For and on behalf of Eliza Barrett, who is dead. Mormons are duty-bound to trace their family history so that their dead relatives can be converted to Mormonism in the grave. This is why the church owns and operates the world's largest genealogical center, headquartered in Salt Lake City. Our living prophet has told us there are three purposes of the church. One is to proclaim the gospel that we've talked about. The other is to perfect the lives of the saints. And the third is to redeem the dead. Consequently, we're actively engaged in doing research work of names and places of birth dates of our families as well as all other mortals that we possibly can. I do the research, and then I take their names to the temple and have them baptized and have them sealed in the house of the Lord as family units. Chuck Sackett's wife, Dolly, was a genealogical research specialist for the Mormon Church who assisted thousands of people in tracking down their dead relatives. Throughout my years as a Mormon genealogical consultant, I was visited regularly by what I believe to be the spirits of my dead relatives. Because of the intensity of my experiences, I disregarded biblical warnings against communications with the dead, never even considering that they were in reality demons or familiar spirits. Because I believed I was literally their savior and their eternal salvation depended on me, I had to remain temple worthy no matter what the cost. What is wanted? The secret names and mystical tokens of the Mormon Melchizedek priesthood are demonstrated by the patron to the worker representing the Lord behind the veil. Present her at the veil and her request shall be granted. What is that? The first token of the Aaronic priesthood. Has it a name? It has. People that go through these ceremonies either for themselves or standing in for the dead experience a tremendous sense of power. Those who have successfully remembered the combination of secret names and handshakes feel responsible for having provided eternal salvation for themselves and the dead whom they represent. Salvation through Jesus Christ is considered by Temple Mormons to be totally insufficient in attaining that personal salvation or godhood. The accompanying incantation is a classic occultic ritual similar to chants in witchcraft, voodoo, Satan worship, and pagan fertility rites. Health in the navel, marrow in the bones, strength in the loins, and in the sinews. Power in the priesthood be upon me and upon my posterity through all generations of time and throughout all eternity. That is correct. Temple patrons are invoking occultic priestcraft power and placing themselves, their families, and future generations under its spell. Eve, having conversed with the Lord through the veil, desires now to enter his presence. Let her enter. A further indictment to the non-Christian nature of Mormonism is the fact that not a single cross appears in or on any Mormon temple. 
However, the pentagram, hexagram, and goat's head, which are the highest of satanic symbols, were used extensively throughout early Mormon architecture. In Salt Lake City, at the LDS Visitor Center, there sits a very quiet statue. This little arrangement is perhaps the most significant display at Temple Square, for it truly represents the blind depth of this Mormon heresy. It is a representation of Adam and Eve kneeling at an altar. On the altar is their offering of fruits and vegetables. A little lamb sits happily at their side. This is the offering of Cain, which God rejected in Genesis 4. Nearly 30,000 missionaries are fielded by the Mormon church today. Missionaries are instructed to use Christian terminology when referring to Mormon doctrine. Potential converts are left with the impression that Mormonism is nothing more than a better form of Christianity. Good afternoon, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you about the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. The success rate is phenomenal. Mormons claim that they are baptizing a new convert every three minutes. Even though nearly all Mormon beliefs and rituals are in direct opposition to Christianity, the Mormon church is able to attract over three quarters of its new converts from Christian churches. Mormons are taught that the Mormon Jesus will eventually return to earth and set up his headquarters near Independence, Missouri, which will be known as the New Jerusalem. Mormons are urged to store two years worth of food and supplies to help see them through the ensuing period of turmoil. Mormons are taught that in the last days before Christ's return, the Constitution of the United States will hang by a thread and will be saved in the nick of time by the elders of the Mormon Church. The United States government will supposedly become a theocracy with the leaders of the Mormon priesthood taking control. At that time, the United Order will be reestablished, a plan which would require all property and possessions to be signed over to the Mormon priesthood. The church would then redistribute the wealth to those who are in good standing with Mormon officials. In preparation for this, the church has already secured a large number of high-level governmental offices. Mormons now hold key positions in the White House, the Cabinet, Congress, the State Department, the Pentagon, the FBI and CIA, as well as in state and local government and law enforcement. The Mormon church views their political involvement as the means of establishing the United Order, which is their way of helping to usher in the Kingdom of God. I am amazed and I'm saddened that I gave 31 years in Mormonism, believing that I could not go to heaven without the consent of Joseph Smith. I want Mormons to realize that Jesus died for all my sins and all their sins that neither of us need Joseph Smith, blood atonement, temple marriage, the wearing of Mormon temple garments, or any of those other things that Mormons have added to the blessed story of the Son of God. The Bible clearly warns that we are not to try to add to the word or to take away from the word. There are very grave consequences in the scripture to those who would dare to add to what God has already revealed. Jesus also said that he was the door to the sheepfold. And he said that those who would seek to come into the sheepfold by any other way other than the door were thieves and robbers. Whenever a religious system claims that the faithful adherence to that religious system is necessary to enter into the kingdom of God, you have another gospel than that which Paul the Apostle preached. And Paul warned about those that would preach any other gospel than that which they had already received by him. We must be careful that we not add to the Word of God. We must be careful that we not try to come into the sheepfold by any other way than the door, Jesus Christ, and through our faith and trust completely in Him. After all of the warnings that God gave to Israel concerning the worship of the false gods 
and the involvement in the false religions, still Israel turned from God and became involved in the abominable practices of the pagan religions around them. We too must be on guard this day that we not be guilty as was Israel in turning from the living way in Christ to some other way to try to enter into the heavenly kingdom. Within all of us, there is a God-shaped vacuum. Throughout the ages, man has attempted to fill that void with the things of the world. But it is only through a relationship with our Creator that we can be truly satisfied. His holy scriptures reveal the way in which we can be reconciled to God, and that is through the provisions of His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Join us again for another edition of The Pagan Invasion.